Shalom and welcome again to another edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and we greatly appreciate you being with us. These podcasts, as many of you know, are designed to explore uh, the issues that touch us and our families and our congregations in light of the revolution in longevity that is reshaping our Jewish world. And we appreciate your support. You can follow us on our website, jewishsacredaging.com, and also on the Jewish Sacred Aging Facebook page. And it is with great pleasure that uh, we welcome to today's uh, Seekers of Meaning a colleague and um, a friend, um, Rabbi Hara Person, the Chief Executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. And um, Hara, welcome. Nice to see you. I hope all is well, you're healthy, and Thank you for being with us in this edition of Seekers of Meaning. How you doing? Great, great to be here with you, Richie. Good, good to see you in, in your palatial home studio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's in everybody, uh, everybody's studios at home. It's it's it, it's really cool. Let let's let's um there's so much to talk about. Let's first, just in case there's one or two people who may not know uh, what the Central Conference of American Rabbis is and how it emerged, uh, and you as yep. the chief executive, tell us, what's the CCAR? Okay. Um, the Central Conference of American Rabbis is the professional organization of reform rabbis. And we were founded in 1889, so we're an old organization. We go way back. We're one of the three, what, what today we call the legacy institutions of Reform Judaism that were founded by Isaac Mayer Wise, um, along with the, the URJ and the HUC. So we were um, originally founded to be a way for rabbis to, um, to come together, to learn from each other, um, and to help sort of shape the movement through the rabbinate. And importantly, also part of that was to published prayer books for the sort of nascent American reform movement. Um, and so that that's who we were today. We have a much more expanded mission, uh, but, but generally, or I should say essentially in a nutshell, our mission is that we aim to support rabbis in all kinds of ways, which I'll elaborate on in a minute, in order to strengthen the Jewish community because we believe that strong rabbis, rabbis who can learn, or rabbis who can lead, rabbis who can grow, um, those are rabbis who are going to help us really um, move forward in, in our history, move our communities forward, and help um, not just create but also maintain strong communities. So um, we do that by um, we provide professional support for rabbis, so learning. We provide all kinds of educational opportunities for rabbis to both um, improve their actual skills uh, and uh, do Torah Lishma to be able to continue to kind of learn in a Jewish context um, from, from wonderful scholars. Um, so continuing professional education like in every profession. Um, we also provide personal support for rabbis who are um, who are struggling in some way or need help in some way. Um, we provide placement services. We provide um, an annual convention. We publish books and resources for the movement and so on. But that's the nutshell of who we are. No, and, and the CCR Press, uh, I mean, we, again, full disclosure, we uh, we've highlighted a lot of the CCAR press books as they've come out because so many right. of them are really, they, they speak to our demographic in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are a very, very powerful force, really, and have become a very, very important part of the rabbinate. You, you've been the, the chief executive of the CCAR now. I think this is in your second year. Um, yeah, about 15 months. But who's counting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in addition to the pandemic, and we'll get to that in a second, and how that's what's been the greatest, what's been the greatest blessing that you found? What's been the greatest challenge that you found uh, in in your tenure so far? Oh boy, um, easy question. <laughs> yeah, um, 
So first of all, I, I love rabbis. Like I couldn't do this job if I didn't love rabbis. And so I would say mm -hmm. that my colleagues are my greatest blessing. I mean, I, I love I love working with rabbis. I love learning from rabbis. I love trying to understand what it is that rabbis need and how we can meet that need. Um, I love the collegiality, the friendships with rabbis, and I love the stories. You know, how did people get to where they are? What motivated them? Um, what their challenges are? Where they want to be? All of that. I, mean, I love all of that. Um, I think that the biggest challenge, look, this pandemic, you know, none of us expected this, right? So there I was, I think it was like month seven, something like that into my tenure. And suddenly like the landscape completely changes. And, you know, I have to scramble because every plan I've made and every expectation I have now is like out the window. So, you know, I, I think interestingly in these eight months, um, we've completely reshaped the organization. And, and again, that's a blessing and a challenge. I mean, the amazing thing is that we have staff and we have a board and we have a, a membership base that worked with us to do that and that supported us in doing that and that made it happen. But it's also a huge challenge to upend an organization, especially an old organization like we are. And, you know, suddenly think like, how do we think completely differently about what we do and how do we make it financially viable to do it as well? So it's been, a, it's been an interesting time. But also people need to know that this, there is a, there's not a huge staff that, that functions uh, the, this, <laughs> Um, challenge is being carried by a relatively few number of people, correct? Yeah, that's true. And and we have a small, I think we do a tremendous amount given the number of staff that we have. <laughs> um, we have a staff of about, um, right now it's about 20 people um, and that's sort of all told. So, you know, um, You're right. from directors to, you know, Distance and so on. Um, we have a hiring freeze, like so many organizations. So you know there are unfilled positions, and and we're just doing the best that we can do. What's what? How has let's deal with the pandemic since it really has reshaped the community and reshaped the rabbit in many ways. What you get these calls, the the people in the in the office get these calls. Uh, you've had conversations with our colleagues, as I've had conversations with our colleagues. Now that the holidays are over. And that we'll get to that in a second. What's what's in your opinion? What's been the greatest impact of the pandemic on our colleagues? Uh, mental health, stress, drain, uh, reevaluation of their own rabbinate. What what or all of the above? None of the above. No, I think all of the above. I mean, I think I think there's been a huge um, sense of anxiety. There's this kind of existential threat that people have been feeling, you know, will my congregation survive? And by the way, not all of our rabbis are in congregations, right? So, right. you know, of our working um, members or sort of what, you know, our members in the active rabbinate, um, we have um, one third are not in congregations. So it's, it's not only congregational, it's also institutional. Um, you know, big questions about survival, well, a survival, um, you know, how do you keep membership engaged and um, involved and dues paying? Um, how do you how do you lift up the importance of being part of a community when people are distant from each other? Um, and you know, and how do you keep how do you lift people's spirits? How do you meet all the emotional needs of the time? Um, you know, I think that those are big questions for rabbis. I think um, there's a lot of anxiety and, um, I mean, you mentioned mental health issues. There are certainly lots of rabbis and rabbis' families who have been right. dealing with mental health issues, just like the regular, you know, the rest of the population, right? We're not like, we're not immune from what the rest of the population is facing. <clears throat> and at the same time, for some rabbis, there's been a great sense of excitement because I think that for some people, it feels like all the conversations we've been having about how we need to radically change what we do and how we do it 
instead of taking, you know, the next 10 to 20 years to kind of meet and talk about what that might look like, like it's happening, it's here, right? You know, we need to grab that moment and really, um, and, and use it smartly and, um, you know, really reconceive who and what we are. So I think it's, it's a mix of, you know, the kind of fear and anxiety and dread <laughs> and some excitement. But I, I want to, we'll get to that in a second, but you, you mentioned something that I really want to ask because I run into this in my just conversations about my work and I talk to colleagues and I think it's important for people who are not in the system, lay people, congregational leadership who may hear this, who project um, almost sometimes a, um, a an image to their clergy, which is unrealistic. And where, how does the CCAR help those colleagues and the, the, our families? It's really important mm -hmm. for people to understand. Right. Who deal with well, perhaps the, when 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 the phone calls are over and the meetings are over and and the existential challenge of their own what the hell is going on here where am I in this I'm getting lost in this I didn't where where's my soul how does the CCR hand work with those colleagues who are going they're going their own existential challenges right now. Well, I, I want to say a, actually a couple of things. So first, I, I want to address one very particular slice. Um, but it's <laughs> I'm saying particular slice, but the reality is it's not. It's actually more widespread. But but here it goes. Um, I think that there's one category of our members who are um, who have a kind of particular challenge, and that is, and and I'm going to make a real generalization here. But what we are hearing from young women with children is staggering. Now we should be able to say young parents, right? And there's certainly, there are men affected by this and there are families that don't have women in them, right? So, I mean, I, I wanna, <laughs> I, I am making no, an over generalization here, okay? But um, but what we are hearing is that the the burden of childcare, right? Because we're talking about families who are home now. You know, how many months are we into this with children? Um, right. From you know, babies and toddlers to kids who are theoretically in school, but school means in front of a screen. Um, you know, who need a lot of parental supervision and, and intervention. Um, the burden of that is falling on women. It shouldn't be right. We could, but it is. And um, what I am hearing from a lot of of um, women rabbis with young kids, in particular, is um, maybe this is a time for me to exit the rabbinate or take some years off, or just you know, I I can't do this. And I think we have really unrealistic expectations for, regardless of gender, for parents with kids at home, especially young kids. We cannot expect them to be able to work the way that they would normally be working with no childcare. And, you know, there was a story um, the other day I heard in a, so a two rabbi family, okay? Um, both parents work at the same congregation. They have a baby. So there's a board meeting and they're, um, and, and the baby's there, because what are you going to do with the baby, right? And, you know, the baby was fussing, you know, whatever babies do. And um, and they got criticized. And I think the, the woman in particular was criticized, like as if it wasn't also the father's responsibility. Um, you know, next time, please make sure that there's coverage for your baby so the baby's not disrupting the meeting. Well, what are you supposed to do with the baby? I mean, that makes no sense. And it's also just so lacking in compassion and lacking in sort of a sense of reality of where we are in this moment. So I think that for, and I'm gonna say parents in general for sure, um, cause it's men too, and it's, you know, two father families and it's single parent families. Right. All. I think that the level of stress is so high and the unrealistic expectations that our institutions have on their staff members who have young children at home, it's, it's just, it's unsustainable. So I think that that's, you know, we're trying in, in a number of ways to advocate for them, um, to, um, 
you know, be be there to um, listen to them, offering potentially some financial assistance. I mean, there there are a number of ways that we're trying to help. Um, what I can say more generally is that we have two staff people on board now, part time. I mean, I wish we could afford to have them full time, but um, and who are um, who who are there in a therapeutic role for our members. Right? One is an MSW. Um, one has a counseling degree in family systems, and um, and our members are able to call them and make appointments to see them and get some help. It's not for long-term help, but it's for mm -hmm. short-term help and then, you know, potentially a referral uh, elsewhere. But I, I think this is really a, a wonderful thing that we're able to offer our members because the, the stress on rabbis, even under normal circumstances, is so high. Um, you know, how you deal with, um, you know, a terrible crisis in your community, how you deal with the stress in your own family over your work obligation, I mean, whatever, all of those things. Um, so that's that's one thing we're we're doing this particular year because of these circumstances. We're offering um, a support group with a trained facilitator uh, for parents, you know, sort of parenting during the pandemic, um, right. things like that. So so we're it, we're we try to um, meet people's needs, and you know we never can do enough, but we're doing what we can do. And then we offer practical help. So you know in in March and April suddenly lots of rabbis were getting cuts to their contracts you know like the, I, I was going to say negotiations but they weren't even negotiations right it was just no, 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 people were being told right you're going to lose this benefit you're going to get this much of a of a reduction in salary so you know we were trying to help people navigate those conversations give them practical advice about how to have those conversations what to put into writing how to best protect yourself you know which isn't to say don't accept a change like that's that the reality is that people had to make those changes we understand but um you know but how, how to best protect yourself for the future that kind of thing so we we do both of those you know the emotional support and the practical support let me ask you also about that other third that there are non -con uh, non congregational rabbis which is which is growing the the chaplaincy yes. uh, other institutional organizations also facing the same economic and communal challenges in many ways. Um, so the the same opportunities for support exist for, for all colleagues. And have you seen changes in those situations, the institutional, the non-congregational, the chaplaincy rabbinate uh, within your work and within, within the CCAR? Have you seen those changes as well? Do you mean, within a pandemic context or more yeah, broadly? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, everyone's being affected. So, you know, when I say that a third of our members don't work in congregations, let me just explain where they are. Um, as you said, some are chaplains, um, some are in the education arena. So whether they're in a day school, they're running a day school, they're teaching at a day school. Um, some are in the university setting. Right, so it could be academics, um, it could be a college chaplain, it could be a college hillel. Um, we have rabbis in the military. Um, we have rabbis in all kinds of organi organizations and institutions, um, you know, all throughout the Jewish world. So, I mean, there, there's a really big variety. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, in many of those sectors, we're seeing the same kind of shrinkage and stress and con financial constraints that we're seeing in the congregational world, absolutely. And so, so you know, a lot of it, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 finish, 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 finish. Go ahead, finish. It, it's, it's the same kind of conversations. Like, you know, it's the same issues about working at home with kids. It's, you know, contracts being changed midstream, um, you know, people losing jobs. I mean, that, that certainly yeah. happened. There are jobs that are being eliminated, reduced, whatever it is. Um, yeah, and, and actually, let me just, sorry, let, let me add one more thing, which is when we're talking about chaplains, we're talking about um, people who in many cases were either were going in on a daily basis to healthcare facilities to do their jobs, like at the height of, you know, the sort of spikes of the pandemic and dealing with death in a way that we don't, you, you know, numbers of deaths, at, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, that was a whole other issue. Um, 
the sort of depression that comes from just dealing with all of this death. Um, and, um, you know, or being a chaplain long distance, you know, through a computer screen, which is, you know, who, who would ever think that that's the way to be a chaplain? So lots of issues. You, you mentioned, you know, the one third non the non-congregational rabbinate, which leads me to ask you also in your work with this explosion of the of the different type of rabbis uh, that are coming, the, the, the big tent, the diversity in what we're seeing in with our membership in the CCAR and, and, uh, and other non-Orthodox uh, rabbinic associations, um, non-traditional families, sexual orientation, uh, right. r- racial diversity, all kinds of different, this is part of the new rabbinate, correct? And uh, how 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 has the CCR begun to embrace this, expand it, and also equally as important, how is the CCR working with congregations to educate congregations of saying, "Hey, this yeah. is the future. This is who we are now." Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I I think that in five years the rabbinate's going to look different, and I think in ten years we're going to look even more different, and you know. 25 years, we're gonna look very different. And I say that looking at um, who who are our HUC students today, right? So we have a much greater diversity of, you know, racial diversity, gender identity diversity. Um, You know, it's it's gonna impact, it hasn't yet really impacted on us a whole lot. I mean, right, because, you know, it takes time. There's this pipeline of people who, you know, come through HUC and then enter the rabbinate. Um, so it's taking a little bit of time, but we are trying to prepare our um, our world for that. Um, you know, we're trying to work really hard on not making assumptions about, for example, what a rabbi looks like. And that's something we, that's already an issue for us just with women in the rabbinate. Um, you know, never mind that we've had women in the rabbinate for almost 50 years, there still is gender bias and in quite a number of ways. So, you know, we're, we're trying to think a lot about how we um, how we message who a rabbi is and what a rabbi looks like. So in, in small ways, like, you know, when we put out um, any kind of marketing material, like who are we showing? You know, what does a rabbi look like visually? Um, we just complete, so we're, we're towards the end of a three year process of the task force of the experience of women in the rabbinate. Uh, Because it turns out that we didn't solve all the gender issues just by admitting women, right? So um, a lot of things have come out of that process. And um, one of the things is a program that we created that that we were um, funded by the SRE um, group to put together um, a program on implicit bias, or really a training on implicit bias. And that addresses, uh, it addresses gender, it addresses gender identity, it addresses race. And um, it's now, it's it's about to be available for free for congregations. And there, there are really three ways to use it for, one is for search committees, one is for boards, and one is for rabbis, because we're employers ourselves. Right. right. And so the idea is that, you know, people will use this material and it, it doesn't make bias go away, but it makes us aware of our bias so that we can manage it. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of conversation about whether implicit bias training works. I think the issue is, you know, we think that it's going to magically make bias disappear. That's not the point. But when we're aware of our biases, then we can manage them, overcome them, acknowledge that, you know, um, and not have them become obstacles. So that's just one example. The uh, you know I'm, I was smiling before because uh, Rabbi Priestin was in was in my class, and when you said close to fifty years, it's sort of like the real, <laughs> the, real you know, the realization that my God, yeah, it is almost fifty years <laughs> since we were ordained. So it's um, it's uh, you know like one of those oh hit, reality hit, smacks you upside the head, but. In those that time since we walked off the beam in, in June on June second of nineteen seventy two, the whole the whole nature of of our profession and the rabbinate has has so changed that the task force um, 
I would be remiss if I didn't ask you just to comment on the reality of this pay inequity. This pay inequity does exist, doesn't it? It does exist. Um, we do a compensation study every three to four years. And what we continue to note, we're actually just about, we're towards the end of the most recent version. It's not out yet. Uh, it's not done yet. But um, we, what we have noted time after time is pay inequity. And the, the numbers that we're working off of are the sort of cleanest numbers possible. They're not self-reported numbers. Um, and um, it's pretty black and white. Men are still making more than women in, in every category. Um, and and that just, that should be unacceptable in our movement, right? It's really a justice issue. How can we allow that to be the case, right? And so we've actually made some changes on a policy level to address this um, in the last, again, through the work of the task force and the experience of women in the rabbinate. So for example, um, now when congregations list job openings, they have to list the salary range, right? It can't be this kind of secret conversation about the salary. That's one way to address pay and equity. But um, I think we, we need to keep communicating that this issue is real and live, and we need our congregational leadership to, to really step up to the plate and say, this is not acceptable. Uh, how are the recent high holidays really were a watershed in my opinion of and very indicative of the changing nature of our congregation and, and the rabbinate um mm -hmm. and i've had this conversation with with several of our colleagues post high holidays that this really is the way the, this is a possible glimpse into the future i mean so because of the pandemic you know everybody is going services on zoom or some platform adult education, et cetera, but they, uh, bar bat mitzvah, et cetera, life cycle events, the changing nature of funerals, shiva, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Looking forward, uh, which I know is a challenge and everything changes, but day by day. But do you ever think that as the synagogue as that we emerge out of the pandemic is ever gonna be able to go back to the way it was and say, well, eventually we all may, have a virtual service once or twice a year, or maybe every week we'll put it on Zoom. Do you think people are gonna be returning to the same old way of associating with worship, especially with worship and education as they did before the pandemic? Or do you think this is um, really the beginning of a sea change in how we deal with congregations? Um, I, I do think it's a change. I, I do think it signals a change for the future. Um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but no, no. Um, no, I don't think we're going back to just sort of what there was. You know, we're not going to just turn the clock back. Um, but I don't think we're going to stay where we are right now. So, um, you know, congregations have been, many congregations have been live streaming for a long time. Um, until the pandemic, live streaming was really kind of a, it was a lovely thing to do, but it was kind of a passive thing to do. Um, I think one, you know, we're learning lots of lessons on the fly in this moment. And um, one of the things that we're learning is that um, there are ways to make that experience less passive. And I think, you know, there are all kinds of examples from all over the country and all really all over North America, I should say, of really wonderful creative things that our rabbis and our congregations have done. Um, and I think we're going to learn from all of that and we're going to incorporate that. I, I mean, God willing, we're going to go back to in person and people actually being able to connect with each other in, in person. But um, I think that we'll probably settle at some sort of hybrid kind of scenario because there are real reasons why people can't always get to the synagogue, oh, right? Yeah. So whether it's, you know, um, people who are homebound, uh, people who are sick, um, you know, parents of young kids who you, you just can't sort of get everyone out of the house into the synagogue. And even if you do, you know, what do you do about the kids? Um, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why. You know, I think we're learning that people do want something, they're craving something. And um, if we can provide some kind of hybrid solution, you know, one of, one of the wonderful things that we've seen is that people are, um, 
Um, <laughs> I, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Um, one of the things that we've seen is that um, congregations are developing ways to make the act of watching and you know listening on the screen less passive. Um, and so whether it's, you know, one of the things I've seen is, is um, assigning somebody from the synagogue, you know, from the staff, or it could right. be a volunteer, assigning them to kind of be a host. So that as people are watching, they're being greeted, they're being welcomed, you know, and then there can be, you know, conversation in the chat uh, between members. How are you doing? How's your mother feeling? You know, and so you really get that communal feeling, which if you're just sort of passively watching on the live stream, you don't get. So I think we're, we're getting better at how to do that. Um, that's just one example. You know, I know some congregations are having different families host Shabbat services so that, you know, they'll, um, you know, you, you, you know, you have all the different screens, but then there's the one family and they're going to do the blessings over you know, the candles, the wine, the challah. Um, they're going to invite you into their home for the evening, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, there's just been, there's been a lot of that. Those are just a couple of examples, but, um, I think that those things make us feel like we are in a community, despite the distance, despite the computer screen. Um, and, but I, I think one of the challenges is, you know, we have these very well-resourced congregations that are doing unbelievable productions, right? And I know that some of the smaller, less resourced congregations do feel kind of a little threatened by some of that, right? Like, right, you know, right, why would right. someone come to me if they can go here, you know, and get this amazing um, Broadway production, right? Right. But what I am actually learning, and, and this is not universal, right? There are plenty of challenges. I, I understand that. But um, people want their rabbi. Like, even if the synagogue, you know, a mile away is doing this unbelievable production, they still they want their rabbi they want to see their friends they want to see the people in their community and so i mean i even had this experience myself i i have a high holiday congregation and it's just this little i mean i love them but it's this little congregation um you know we just did a live zoom service i mean there was nothing fancy about what we did and people didn't have to come you know they could have they had they could have gone anywhere, like really anywhere. And they came. And right. they came because they wanted that connection to the identity of the congregation, to the rabbi, to the cantor. You know, they wanted to be together. And I found that incredibly moving. Right, and I think that is, that's the key. That's the hook, that's the secret. I wanna see my friends and the people I've grown up with, the people we, we go out to dinner with, and. Our kids went through preschool together and that that's they helped me i helped them that's that's really the key once you get over the the production quality um it really does basically come back down to the primacy of the core relationships that you build within a synagogue yep. uh, before we start running out of time just one or two really things quick things that also are emerging um the the rise of the so-called entrepreneurial rabbinate um is this how is the ccir dealing with this or is it just folding it into just normal conversation or is there a, are we producing a task force on this or or are we waiting to see what how this emerges um well we're not we're not doing a task force on it um you know i i will say honestly that this conversation now has taken a little bit of a backseat to the pandemic issues but right. it, it is certainly part of that of the broader conversation um i i am really proud of those rabbis who have jumped into the kind of entrepreneurial world i think it's it's creative and brave and some wonderful things have been happening um, you know, it takes a lot of guts to to do that. Um, I think we're going to see. So right now, I think that that has somewhat slowed down, but I think we're going to see more of it when things stabilize. Um, for one thing, 
there are not enough congregational jobs for all the rabbis. And that, that's okay. I mean, I'm not saying that in a blaming kind of a way. Um, it's real. You know, it's, real. Before, it's real. Before 2008, there were more rabbinic positions. Um, some of them got added back when, you know, in 2010 or, or whatever. Um, we're seeing a reduction now in rabbinic positions again. Will they come back in a few years? Well, God willing, they will. But, you know, I think that they're overall, we're seeing a shrinkage. Look, a lot of our congregations are shrinking and right. merging and so on. I mean, I think we're at a, we're, we're in an interesting moment in terms of our history here um, in North America. So, you know, and some synagogues are certainly growing, right? But, um, but I think that one of the responses to that shrinkage is uh, the entrepreneurial approach. And, you know, those approaches are there to sort of solve a problem in a sense, right? To like reach out to people who otherwise aren't finding a home, right? Aren't finding a Jewish home, aren't finding a synagogue um, for whatever reason. And so if these attempts can fill those needs, I think that's wonderful. Um, you know, is there a way to connect into the larger Jewish community? I think that would be a great thing to see. But, you know, I, I think that, um, I think we've we've lost some of our history in terms of who and what a rabbi was before this sort of era that we're living in in North America. Because if you think back into our history, rabbis were generally not employed full time as rabbis in their synagogues, right? <clears throat> you know, being a rabbi was something you did in addition to you know, think about Rashi as a vintner, right? Or, you know, Maimonides as a doctor and Scott, like, you know, we live in a very particular era in, if you look at the whole scope of Jewish history, right? We, we never, um, until the modern era, we didn't rely on synagogues to be um, the, the places that fully supported our entire rabbinate. And while it would be wonderful if we, could do that today. I just, A, I don't think that the future is going to support that. And B, not every rabbi wants to be within that framework. Anyway, it's not every rabbi's skill set. It's not every rabbi's vision. And I think that that's okay. But it does require shifting our mindset. So it's not about, you know, if I don't get this big congregational job, I failed as a rabbi. No, not at all. But maybe no. there's some other way that you bring your gift and maybe you're doing it part time and you're doing something else part time. And that's kind of the reality, um, you know, or you're fundraising for your entrepreneurial vision or your, um, you know, I, so I think that there is a shift we're going to have to really be talking more about going forward. Like what's realistic to expect in your career as a rabbi? Um, you know, there isn't a one size fits all. And speaking of one size fits all, I have to ask you this question before we start running out of time. And that is how how is the CCR now dealing with this rise in the in the alternative seminaries, um, various types of ways to be ordained, a mail order, rabbinate, um, th this whole sea from it's such a different way from, you know, like way back when in a galaxy far away when I was ordained in 72, you know. And now all these different types of options. Um, yeah. how, is the, how, is, how is the CCR dealing with this? <clears throat> um, it, is, it is a challenge. It's a challenge because um, people don't necessarily understand and appreciate what the difference is between a rabbi who went to HUC or another qualified institution right. Um, who received a really rigorous rabbinic education with standards, with real expectations about Hebrew, about text knowledge, about ritual knowledge, um, and as a member of the CCR and a, a um, requirement to adhere to an ethics code, a very rigorous ethics code, um, people don't understand the benefit of a rabbi with those qualifications versus somebody who spent six months or 18 months or whatever it is online 
um, you know, and paid for their ordination. Um, there's a vast world of difference. I'm not saying that everybody who gets one of those quickie ordinations is a terrible person. Some of them are lovely people. And I completely recognize that not everybody can pull up stakes and, you know, go to Israel for a year for the first year of HUC and, you know, go to New York, Cincinnati or LA for the next four years. I, I totally get that. Um, I was one of those students myself. I started HUC with the baby and, you know, a husband who had a job who couldn't move and whatever. I mean, my personal story aside, just to say, you know, I, I understand the challenge of it. However, um, getting one of those quickie ordinations is not the same thing as having an ordination that is built on years of study, standards, requirements, and once you're ordained, a rigorous ethics code that you have to adhere to. You know, we get, we get complaints about rabbis who you know, did this thing, did that thing. And they're in our synagogues, right? They're not members of the CCR because they don't meet our standards. There's nothing we can do about it. And then the congregation wants to know, well, you know, what do we do when the rabbi does this thing? Well, can't help you. They're, they're you know, they're not one of our members. They don't meet our standards. Right. I mean, this is, this is part of the challenge uh, of the new rabbinate and then the new American Jewish community where there's a lot more choices both coming in and once you're out and for lay people and congregational leaders and institutional leaders, as well as potential students. Uh, and it really opens up a wide variety of different types of approaches of conversation. It's so different. And at the same time, it's so in, way, in many ways energizing because it's creating more opportunities uh, for these types of conversations. But obviously mm -hmm. it makes your job as the chief executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis a little bit more, let's say, challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you're not bored. <laughs> I know, I know I you're not, not bored. bored. I am not bored. Um, <laughs> Harold, let me just finish up by just asking you this one easy final question. And I, again, I appreciate your your honesty, your openness, and most of all your time, because I know you're 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 overwhelmed with with stuff. What do you say to that young man or woman who you meet in a congregation or online who walks up to you and says, Rabbi Person, I'm thinking about becoming a rabbi, but it seems so daunting in this world. What do you, what do you think I should do? What kind of advice do you give to that young person? Yeah. Great question. Um, I, I think, you know, I would say pursue it. It's a great thing to do with your life. You have to do it for the right reasons, right? You, you have to do it. It's not about your ego. Um, it's not, you shouldn't do it if it's, you know, you loved camp, you loved youth group, and you're not sure what else to do with your life, that's not really the reason to go to rabbinic school, right? And so I, I do think that people have to have realistic expectations. You're not necessarily gonna, you know, get the top of the pick jobs all along the way. You know, there are only so many rabbis who are gonna be able to be the senior rabbis of large congregations, right? But if you're going in for the right reasons, if you have a passion and you're willing to, to work hard and you're willing to serve the Jewish people and you know be a link in that chain of our history, um, and you have the, the, the you know, sort of um, the soul for it, go for it. I mean, it's, it's an honorable and wonderful thing to do, but it's a hard thing to do. Well, it's, yes. But to give a gift of changing a person's life um, mm -hmm. is um, the reward without measure, to paraphrase a well-known prayer. Uh, Rabbi yeah. Hara Person, executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. Um, Hara, thank you very, very much for your time, your wisdom, your your soul, because you are one of the great, the great souls. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, I've known you for a few years and you are truly a treasure and a gift, a gift to the community, the whole community. So stay healthy, stay safe, continued good luck, uh, take care of yourself and we'll see you um, continue to bump into each other, hopefully along the trail, so so, so to speak. Thank you, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so much for your gifts.
you all well, thank you you you're very very welcome you're thank you to all of you i want to thank you again for listening to today's edition of seekers of meaning the podcast of jewish sacred aging and a reminder that you can follow us on our website jewishsacredaging.com and uh, the facebook page jewish sacred aging on facebook and we appreciate your continued support if you'd like to uh, make a donation tax-free donation to further the jewish sacred aging work go to the website click on that handy dandy very easy to find donate button and just follow the prompts we appreciate your support also in our ideas and suggestions you can get to me and give them to me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com these podcasts are recorded at the studios of uh, lubetkin global media in cherry hill new jersey and we thank our absolutely wonderful and supportive uh, producer steve lubetkin again to all of you thank you very much for uh, being with us. We look forward to greeting you on the next edition of Secrets of Meaning, the podcast of Jewish Sacred Aging. Toda and Shalom. Take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. <laughs>